So thank you so much for everybody who's joining us online. And thank you to all of you who are here as we continue our series entitled Upside Down Kingdom. Upside Down Kingdom. Each week I've been preaching one sentence. One sentence. From Scripture, from the words of the Bible, derive everything that we need for life and godliness. I'm waiting on an amen for that. From the words of Scripture, derive everything that we need with regards to life and godliness. And we have been diving in to some sentences of Jesus that are often kind of jumped across and our familiarity with them often robs the rich and dimensional meaning that is present within. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to be in verse 7 today. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. When you have it, say amen. If you're still looking, say, wait a minute. I got no honest people in the house today. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. It's going to be on the screen behind me. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Will you say that with me? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I want to speak to you this morning from the simple subject, the merciful. The merciful. Can you tell that to your neighbor, the merciful, the merciful? Hopefully you're a merciful person. If not, I believe that the Lord's going to speak to us today a little bit about what that means for us. Theological terms like mercy and grace and faith and justification are often kind of thrown around without ever being explained. And there's kind of this presupposition or this understanding from stage that everybody's just on the same page when a term is thrown out like mercy or peacemaker or justification or faith. And we gloss over these terms thinking sometimes that we understand or grasp the fullness of what a term or concept means, and yet we sometimes miss it. Rarely do we pause and deeply ponder Something like mercy. Let me ask you this. When was the last time you just sat in your room alone and said, I'm just pondering and thinking about mercy, what that means, what God's mercy means in my life, and what God's mercy does in my situation? But our familiarity oftentimes with terms like mercy and the Beatitudes and Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, it creates this kind of monotony when we hear it and we say, oh, I get it. I understand what it means. I know what that's talking about. Blessed are the merciful, they'll receive mercy. Got it. Next. I believe God has something for us today out of these words. In the Old Testament, mercy is one of the primary indicators of God's own character. When Moses pleaded with God and he said, please reveal yourself to me, show yourself to me, reveal your nature and your character, God hid him in the cleft of a rock in Exodus chapter 34. And God began to speak over him and say these words, the Lord, the Lord, who's merciful and gracious, whose steadfast love extends from generation to generation. Mercy is one of the primary characteristics of God's identity, character, and nature, even in the Old Testament. Oftentimes, we create a false caricature where we think about the Old Testament and we say, oh, God's just mad at people and ready to zap them, right? If they mess up, he's ready to just stomp them out and punish them and, and do bad things to the people in the Old Testament. But no, the primary indicator of his nature and character is that of mercy. In fact, 
that is precisely what God desired from his people. I think about the prophet Hosea who cried out in Hosea 6.6, God desires mercy rather than sacrifice. He desires mercy. The prophets of old continually compelled the Israelites to practice mercy toward the outsider, mercy toward the poor, mercy toward the downtrodden. It's upon this backdrop of the Old Testament that Jesus' Sermon on the Mount rests. This backdrop of mercy where Jesus enters in and says these words, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. This fifth beatitude, can you believe we're already on number five? We've been through four the past four weeks. We're on number five. This fifth beatitude is different from the previous four. The first four beatitudes primarily focus on a disposition or attitude within. Poor in spirit, meek in heart, right? They're, they're primarily these inward dispositions and attitudes that then find expression secondarily through one's behavior. But there's a transition that takes place here in this fifth beatitude where the primary concern here is with the behavior of mercy, not just the disposition or inward attitude of mercy. It's talking about blessed are those who are merciful, who are actively extending mercy toward other people. Somebody shout merciful. Merciful. Amen. The question remains, though, what does it mean to give mercy? Write this down. Number one, give mercy. Give mercy. What, what does it mean to give mercy? Because that's what Jesus is interested in. He's, he's pronouncing heaven's blessing on those who are merciful. So what in the world does it mean to give mercy? One giving mercy embraces, I like how, Craig Blomberg says that he's a great New Testament scholar. He says this, one giving mercy embraces the characteristics of being generous. Somebody say generous. Forgiving others, having compassion for the suffering, and providing healing of every kind. Mercy is often confused with grace. Mercy and grace, in fact, are often used interchangeably. We say that often. Well, we pray God's mercy and grace be upon you. And we use mercy and grace almost in this interchangeable way, but they're quite different. Mercy is getting at an undeserved exchange or transaction, right? There should have been punishment. There should have been judgment. There should have been something that was bad given. Mercy is not giving the bad thing, but instead giving the good thing. Come on, y'all are going to get this in about a minute when I start preaching it. See, y'all thought I was already preaching. I'm just getting through the introduction. But, but mercy is this exchange where something that was wicked is now being exchanged and something good is given in its stead or in its place. Grace is primarily concerned with giving another opportunity to do the right thing and giving the strength to do the right thing. Let me give you an example that's beautiful of how mercy and grace look. Mercy looks like Jesus on the cross in our place. Our place, it was our place to die because of our sin. Mercy is that the sinless, spotless Lamb of God took our place and was punished instead. That's mercy. Grace looks like the empty tomb. Grace looks like the empty tomb that doesn't stay filled with Jesus' body, but that is empty and there's power given now. There's resurrection power given. There's grace given to overcome and give you another chance and another opportunity. Mercy and grace. Rarely do we pause and just say, what is that mercy? What does that look like? What does it mean to be one who gives mercy. It's the extension and graciousness to somebody who doesn't deserve it. 
I love that in this beatitude, Jesus is careful not to describe who deserves mercy. You see that? He doesn't give a descriptor or he doesn't give an object of who should receive mercy. Because watch this, we love to create false lines and categories about who deserves mercy and who doesn't. And so Jesus doesn't even give people the opportunity to do that. He just says, no, blessed are the merciful. Merciful, not just to a specific group, not just to a specific socioeconomic status, not just to a specific political party, not just to a specific ideology, but those who are merciful to all. Jesus is not interested in our false lines of division that we like to create around situations and around people. But Jesus does not identify who is deserving of that mercy. In Jesus' ministry, he actually specialized in giving mercy to the people who seemingly deserved it the least. You would think that the religious leaders who did all the right things, who checked all the right boxes, you would think that they would be worthy of receiving the mercy of Jesus. And yet it was the blind man who's on the side of the road who's crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It was the ones who were most unlikely. It was the ones who were seemingly the most undeserving who Jesus specialized in extending mercy to. I don't know about you today, but there are times in my life where I've felt so undeserving of the mercy of Jesus, and yet I have cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus loves breaking the boundaries and the boxes that we try to create for him about who is deserving of mercy and who is not. When the religious leaders tried to further trap Jesus and figure out who is it that really is deserving of mercy, one of the lawyers came before Jesus and said, I've kept all the religious regulations and laws. I've I've done all this from my youth. And Jesus launches into a very familiar parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Within the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus begins to outline three very different responses towards somebody who was in need of mercy. The story goes that there was a man who was beaten and left on the side of the road. He was robbed and he was tattered and he was in very bad and critical condition. And a priest came by. One who you would think would be interested in helping and demonstrating mercy to those who are hurting and those who are in need. You would think that it would be the priest who would stop and say, how can I help? But because of his religious purity and his ritual service in the temple, he said, I I don't want to dirty myself on my way home. I've already been home long enough away from my family. I I, I want to get back to to the routine of my life, and I don't want to sidestep and have to go through all the purification rituals. I don't need to demonstrate mercy. You would think that the Levite would. Again, another in religious service in the temple. And as he's going toward the temple on the other side of the road, the Levite says, no, I, I, I'm not going to help either. I'm, I, I'm about to serve in the temple. I, I, I don't have time to show mercy to this person in need. And yet Jesus condemns the religiosity of the Pharisees and the scribes and the lawyers because they neglected the weightier matters of the law to do and love mercy. And Jesus just exploded their minds and their expectations and their understandings and said, finally, there was a Samaritan who against all cultural odds, against all the cultural boundaries and dividing lines of the day, bypassed them all because he said, here's a man who needs mercy. He's been beaten, unrecognizable, and he needs help. Jesus said, that's what I'm after. That's what I'm looking for. 
Not the priest or the Levite who's so concerned with the ritual that they miss the whole point. Showing mercy to the person who's been beaten and left for dead on the side of the road. That's mercy. Remember preparing a sermon one time. I was preaching from Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. It's about mercy and justice and walking rightly and humbly before the Lord. And I was preparing a message, and I was in the zone, right? When I'm writing sermons, I put, sometimes put my headphones in. I'm, I'm in the zone. I'm, I'm typing out. I'm hearing, maybe hearing from the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm really focused in, and I'm in the flow, right? I'm going in the flow. How many of you have ever been writers or you're writing something, and once you get started, you kind of want to stay in the flow. You don't want to stop. There he is. Coop is there. Judah's there. Um, that's where I was. And in the midst of being in the flow, I was at a church that I was serving at, and there was a ring on the church's doorbell. And I went to the door, and it was raining outside, and there was a man there who was soaking wet, head to toe, drenched, looked like he had been literally just jumped in a pool with his clothes on, dripping from top to bottom. And I thought, man, I'm, I need to get back to the sermon. I'm Flow. What, what can I do? What's going on? I'm just being honest. Can I be honest with you? This, this was a few years ago. The Lord's dealt with me since then. And in the midst of my own thought process about this guy, he says, my family's gone out of town. He said, I've lost everything. I was hardworking. I worked a job. He said, I've walked 20 miles. I've been walking since 5 a.m. He said, I've walked 20 miles to this point, and there's only a mile left. I don't have a phone. I'll take you to where I need to go. I'll tell you exactly where it's at. I don't, I don't want food. I don't want water. I just want to go home. In that moment, all the religious spirit within that said, I need to get back to what's important. I need to hurry and focus. Vanished. The Lord said, I need to teach you what it means to show mercy before you preach about mercy. I need to teach you how to be gracious and compassionate towards somebody and not just assume the worst and say they're just after money or they're just after something or why don't they just get a job or why don't they do. I need you to show some mercy. Don't be so quick to condemn. Don't be so quick to say somebody else will do it. You take the initiative and show mercy. Got in the car. Got him cleaned off. Got him something to drink and something to eat. Dropped him off at his house. He took me exactly where it was. He was telling the truth. He was right there. Mercy. Lord said, I need to show you something about what that looks like. The merciful are the ones that heaven is looking out in the earth for and saying, I want to declare and proclaim and pronounce a blessing over. The merciful do not have tidy parameters around who deserves it and who doesn't. The merciful are not interested in creating more dividing lines about this person's worthy of another chance and this person is not. The merciful look at those in need and see through the eyes of God and say, I want to have compassion on you. They see one suffering. They see one in need and they respond. Mercy indicates that the person doesn't deserve it. That's why it's called mercy. They, they don't deserve it. So if we go around creating these lines of who deserves it and who doesn't, we miss the whole point of mercy. Because mercy's intent is to be extended to the ones who least deserve it. Jesus looked out at the crowds. He looked out at his disciples 
as he's inaugurating the kingdom of God in the earth. And he's beginning to teach about this ethic of the kingdom of God and what it means to live in this kingdom. And he said, the people who live in my kingdom are a people full of mercy. They love extending forgiveness and compassion to other people. They don't hold wrongs against them. They don't say you're undeserving or you're unworthy. In fact, they look at the very people who've made fun of them at work, who've called them names, who've laughed at them, and they say, how can I help you in their time of need? You know what mercy looks like? It looks like the one who maybe made fun of the car that you drove and made fun of your financial situation, and then they find themselves in a difficult spot financially. Mercy looks like not saying, well, you shouldn't have made fun of my car. Look at you now. That's not mercy. That's a vindictive spirit. Mercy says, what do you need? Can I get you a gas card? Can I help you? Mercy looks at the people who've been so cruel and mean and unfriendly, and it says, how can I extend God's love and compassion to you? Mercy looks at the most undeserving and exchanges graciousness, kindness, and compassion. Church, it's time to give mercy. Somebody say that to your neighbor, give mercy. Because heaven's blessing rests upon those who give mercy. The text doesn't end with giving mercy, though. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Write that down, receive mercy. Receive mercy. This is what I like to call a divine transaction. A divine transaction. This beatitude actually doesn't invoke the name of God. It utilizes what's called a divine passive, where the subject of this verb of shall receive mercy is not given. They don't want to, since this is to a Jewish audience, they don't want to invoke the name of God. They want to use it as few times as possible because the Jewish people think the name of God is so sacred and they don't want to overuse it. And yet God is still the one shown here giving the mercy. This is what Jesus is trying to explain. That it's God who's giving the mercy. That's why Jeremiah was able to say in Lamentations chapter 3 that it's God's mercies that are new every morning. His mercies are new. That's why in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul said, God who is rich in mercy, who loved us even when we were dead in trespasses. That's why Peter was able to say, it's according to his great mercy that he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We must be careful, though, in this, par- in this uh, beatitude, not to mistake or misunderstand what Jesus is saying. Because it's easy for us to create a works righteousness schema or paradigm where we say, if I just show enough mercy and do enough good stuff, maybe, just maybe, at the end of the age, God will give mercy to me and be kind to me if I just do enough. John Stott, he's a great scholar, he talks about this, and he says, no, 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 no. We have to understand first that it's God's mercy that's extended to us initially that awakens within us the ability to give mercy to other people. When we taste and experience the mercy of God and the forgiveness of Jesus, it awakens something within us that we can't treat people the same anymore. We can't treat them the way they deserve to be treated because we know how we deserve to be treated and God hasn't dealt with us that way so we don't deal with other people that way. It's mercy. Jesus deals with this in Matthew chapter 18 with the parable of the unmerciful servant. He tells a story like this. He says, there was a servant who had a great debt, one that he probably couldn't pay off in a lifetime. And he was put in this holding place, this prison, because he couldn't pay it off. But the master 
came and forgave him of this insurmountable debt that could not be repaid. And the servant was so grateful and so excited. He could be with his family again. He could see people again. He could go back to his job again. He could do what he loved doing again. He wasn't in prison anymore. And the debt was freed from him. What did this servant do? This servant hired and had his own servants. And his own servant had a tiny, small debt, much smaller than the one that was forgiven him that his master forgave. And yet he held this debt against this servant and said, you've got to pay this back. It's unacceptable that you wouldn't pay this back. The master who forgave the first servant of this insurmountable debt said, how could you? How, knowing that I forgave something that was unforgivable, that I cleared the debt that you so owed, then you hold this tiny amount against your own servant, you wicked servant. What is wrong? Because those, Jesus said, who give mercy, receive it. Receive it. Jesus taught in that parable, how can those of us who've received God's kindness, God's forgiveness, and God's great mercy, then look out at our brothers and sisters, look out in the people in this world, and not extend mercy in the way that it's been extended to us. How can we not do that? The mercy that we're able to give first comes from the mercy that we receive from the cross of Jesus we celebrated it today. We talked about it. We sang about his mercy, his grace, his kindness, the way that he has made a way. He demonstrated and extended mercy to us first. But the mercy that is spoken of in this passage is not primarily about the present experience of mercy. The text indicates that there's a future reception of mercy. That's why Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive, shall receive mercy. The mercy that this text is talking about primarily and Jesus is teaching about is the mercy that will be fully received and experienced at the judgment for every individual who's ever lived on the face of the earth will stand before the throne of God in judgment. Every single person will stand before, just read about Revelation 19 through 22, and it details real clearly about this judgment seat of God. Every person in human history will stand before the judgment of the Lord and in that day, we do not want to be like the servants who are holding debts against people saying, I'm not going to show mercy. I'm not going to show mercy. No, we want to stand before God saying, I have given mercy. And the same way that I have received mercy, I've been one who's given mercy. I've held nothing back. How fearful it would be to stand before the Lord knowing of his graciousness and his kindness and his mercy toward us and his forgiveness and his compassion toward us. And yet we stood and said, I'm not going to give that person mercy. They messed up too many times. They missed the mark too many times. No, that was their last chance. That was their last opportunity. I gave them five chances and they missed out. No, let's be people who extend mercy in the same way that God has given mercy to us. When we stand before God at the end of all things, at the judgment of Christ, here's what we're going to say. We're not going to say, look at, look at how great I was. Look at how many good things I did. Why? Because even our righteousness looks dirty before God. We're not going to say, look at, look at all the great things that I did. Look how many times that I read my Bible. Aren't you impressed? Look at how many times I fasted. Look at my righteousness. Look how many times that I attended church. 
Look how many times that I served on one of the teams here at the church. Look, look at all this, God. Look, look, look. No, no, we're going to stand before him and say, I cling to the old rugged cross. I cling to the mercy of Jesus. I cling to the battered body of Jesus. I cling to his blood. I cling to his grace. I cling to his mercy. And we will throw ourselves at the feet of God saying, we cling to the mercy of Jesus. Because it's not by righteous acts and deeds that we're purified, but it's by the great mercy and forgiveness of the Lord. Jesus wants all people who enter his kingdom to understand that mercy is the disposition of a disciple, mercy is the attitude. Mercy is the action. Mercy is that which is extended from the life of a disciple. Jesus does not know a disciple who harbors hatred and anger in his or her heart toward another over their their state of undeservedness. But Jesus looks at his disciples and says, I expect you to be merciful because I gave you what you didn't deserve. You deserved, and I deserved what Jesus received. That's mercy. Jesus gasping for air, tortured on a cross, suffering because of us. That's mercy. So when you look out and your coworker makes you angry, the people in your family make you upset, you've had a rough day, say, I just don't know. If I can extend any more, I think I'm at the end of my rope. Remember Jesus. Remember the mercy that you've received in the present. And remember the mercy that Jesus promised in the future to those who are merciful. Church, will you stand with me? Jesus said this, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those who are compassionate and generous and forgiving toward others. Blessed are those who give people second and third and fourth and fifth and 20th chances and hundredth chances. Blessed are those who are gracious toward others and forgiving and kind. Church, we need an increase of mercy in the earth. There is a lack of mercy. There's a lack of mercy in the earth. And Jesus today looks out in this house and he says, Where are my disciples who will look into the eyes of the people who've wronged them? who will look into the eyes of the people who've hurt them the worst and say, I forgive you. I extend you the same level of mercy that Jesus has extended to me. I want everybody in this moment, if you will, just to close your eyes, focus in on this moment. This is a sacred moment in the presence of the Lord. This is a sacred moment in his presence. Maybe today you're under the sound of my voice or you're watching online and you say, I've never received Jesus' mercy. I've never received Jesus' mercy in my life. I've never received his forgiveness. And I want to, if that's you, will you just lift up your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it? I want to receive Jesus' mercy and forgiveness. I want to receive it. I want to receive it. Thank you, Lord. Maybe today you're here and you say, you know what, I I have a difficulty looking at people kind of in a judgmental way, not intentionally, but I just don't always see the best and I think skeptically and I 
I doubt the sincerity of their need, and, and I, I'm not really a person who has much mercy, and I, I don't really extend graciousness toward people as much as I want to, but, but as you've been preaching, I, I really sense that, that God is pulling on my heart and saying, you are called to be one who gives mercy. I feel the Lord right now who's speaking to your heart and he's saying, I, I want you to extend mercy. I feel even right now that there's somebody that you've had in a strange relationship with, with your family and God is saying, extend mercy. I feel that it's immediate family. Father, mother, brother, sister, there's somebody in your immediate family you know who you are that God is saying, if that's you and nobody's looking, if you could just slip up your hand and say, I need to extend mercy. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. 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 I need to extend mercy. I need to extend mercy. Yes. Yes. Holy Spirit, give them the strength right now in the name of Jesus. Give them the strength to extend mercy. Holy Spirit, pour out your mercy on them right now that their, that their lips would be dripping with mercy in conversation. That when they're together around them, that, that, that mercy would be their disposition and their attitude. Lord, I thank you right now that you're increasing their capacity for mercy. The people who said, yes, I, I need to extend it. I also feel that there's a friendship. Maybe there was a betrayal I feel that there's a, there's a friendship that really hurt. Somebody did you wrong, and, and, and it's been really hard to let that go. And God is saying, extend mercy. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand? I want to pray over you that you would have mercy. Yes, yes, extend, Lord Jesus, extend. God, pour out your mercy upon them. This is your heart's desire. Holy Spirit, this is what you long for, to pour out mercy, mercy, that they would see the mercy given to them and say, there must be a God in heaven. There must be a God in heaven. There's no way they would treat me this way. I don't deserve to be treated this way. I've been so cruel to them. God, give them mercy. Give them mercy. Lord, I just thank you that everybody who was lifting their hands is saying, I, 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 need to, I need to give mercy. I thank you that you're equipping and empowering them. They can't do it in their own strength. I can't do it in my own strength. We need you, Holy Spirit. Pour it out in this moment. I also feel that in the room there are some people who are having difficulty receiving God's mercy. You've even said to yourself, I don't think God can forgive that. You may not have vocalized it, but you've heard it in your mind. You felt it in your heart, and you said, I just don't know if God can forgive that. I know that this is okay, and he might have forgiven this, but this, this was too much. And you're having difficulty receiving mercy. You're having difficulty receiving Jesus' mercy. If that's you right now, would you just lift up your hand? I want to pray over you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Oh, there's nothing to, there's nothing that can separate you from the love and mercy of God today. There's nothing that can separate you. Oh, the lies of the enemy would try to deceive you and say that the chasm is too wide, the gap is too far, but the gap has been bridged by the outstretched arms of Jesus, the nail-pierced hands of Jesus, the bloodied and battered Son of God looks at you today and says, nothing can separate you. Nothing can keep you from receiving my mercy. So right now, I thank you, Holy Spirit, that people who've been struggling with receiving your forgiveness, they're being washed over right now. And the things that have been blockading and blocking their ability to receive are being washed away right now. They're being washed away. Lord, thank you in this moment that you're washing away resistance to receiving mercy. You're washing it away. Church, I, I always love to conclude with a prayer of blessing. So if you're comfortable, if you could, just open out your hands like this, like you're receiving a gift. I want to pray a prayer of blessing over you before you're sent out of this house. Church, I bless you today in the name of God the Father. 
I bless you today in the name of God the Son. And I bless you today in the name of God the Holy Spirit. Oh, that your mind, when, when thoughts would arise and say you're unworthy to receive, you would, you would experience the affirmation of God the Father saying, I have made you worthy through my Son. I've made you worthy through my Son. That when condemnation rises in your heart, God is greater than your heart, and he knows all things, and his mercy endures forever. His steadfast love and mercy are chasing after you. I bless your hearts today that they would expand right now. Right now, every heart would expand to receive a greater portion of the mercy of God. There would be a great expansion right now to receive everything that God has in terms of mercy for your life. I bless your hands and feet today that as you're sent out of this house, that you would be one who not only receives the mercy of Jesus, but you would extend it to the least deserving, not just your favorite family members, not just your favorite coworkers and friends, but that your hands would extend mercy to the least deserving recipient of it. Oh, that God would strengthen you to give you the strength to show mercy, that from your hands and feet they would experience the level of mercy that you yourself has received from Jesus. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you blameless before his presence with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, right now, in this moment, and forevermore. Amen.